Hello and welcome to FFRF's Ask an Atheist. I'm Sammy Lawrence, a legal fellow here at FFRF. Today we're going to discuss religious freedom and what it really means. Unfortunately, the far right has been co-opting this phrase to the detriment of the rest of us. As always, we want to hear from you. Please send your thoughts to um, askanatheist at ffrf.org or leave your questions in the Facebook comments below. I'm joined today by FFRF staff attorney, Chris Line. Hey. Um, why don't you get us started with today's topic, Chris? Yeah. As I'm sure everyone's already aware, the First Amendment protects our right to believe whatever we choose. You know, here at FFRF, we believe in true religious freedom, which requires a strict separation between church and state. The government cannot favor or disparage any group based on their religious beliefs or their lack thereof. Uh, the First Amendment allows individuals to live according to their own deeply held values, but it doesn't, force, uh, doesn't allow us to force our values on everyone else. Um, religious organizations like the Alliance Defending Freedom, uh, other groups like that, they're always talking about religious freedom, pushing religious freedom and, and uh, being activists about that. Uh, when it, but they, they're really trying to further dismantle the wall between church and state, even as they argue that that wall is a myth. Uh, but if the wall is destroyed, you know, what happens next? Um, according to their website, Alliance Defending Freedom, defends religious freedom and opposes all attempts to compel people to compromise their beliefs or retreat from civil and political life as a price for following their faith. They further claim, as secular forces chip away at our nation's Judeo-Christian roots, religious freedom is increasingly threatened. So it's kind of interesting that they talk about religious freedom, but then talk about Judeo-Christian roots and also talk about secularism as a bad thing. When, as I explained, secularism is a necessity for religious freedom. Yeah, it definitely seems contradictory. Right. And that's sort of the point that I'm trying to get at today, that uh, when the religious right talks about religious freedom, they mean freedom for Christians. They mean Christian prayer to start meetings. They mean, uh, you know, Christians getting to exempt themselves from laws that they disagree with or laws that might be neutral, you know, things that apply to everyone but it's not gonna apply if you're a Christian. So that's typically what they're meaning when they say religious freedom. Uh, you know, they like to pretend that, you know, religion and Christianity are synonyms, but that's a rhetorical twist with a purpose. Uh, it's a recognition that we're not as a nation quite ready to propose the First Amendment is for Christians only as they'd like, uh, at least not yet. But the truth is once the wall of separation of church and state is gone, all manner of beliefs can get through. Uh, you know, and, and then what happened? Will we have freedom for all beliefs? Uh, will it, you know, we be dealing with a battle, basically, if we say, okay, no more separation of church and state. We're going to turn the government into a battleground where Christians will fight to push their religious freedom. Uh, Muslims, uh, Jews, other religious groups, minority religious groups, and they'll just turn into this battle uh, where every group is trying to use the government to push their religion. Uh, I think all of our viewers probably know that that's not a tenable position. That's why we at the Freedom From Religion Foundation work to protect the separation of church and state uh, and our secular government because neutrality with regard to religion is the best way to deal with it as opposed to going to a meeting and going, are we going to have Christian prayer to start the meeting? Should we let an atheist do it? Um, we should just have no prayer at all and we'll leave religion to the private conscience of each person. Um, you know, so as you know, we've been dealing with a lot of issues over the past couple months that revolve around this topic. Uh, one group that's been very good at testing the waters of religious freedom is the Satanic Temple, and their activism has revealed the hypocrisy of many lawmakers who claim to support religious freedom. In February, just months after a Satanic display in the Iowa Capitol caused a panic that ended with the display being vandalized, a legislator in Arizona introduced a bill that would ban Satanic displays in public spaces. Just days later, an Iowa legislator proposed a bill that would ban satanic displays or the practice of Satanism on state property. Not to be outdone, Mississippi immediately jumped into the fray with a bill banning satanic memorials, statues, altars, displays, symbols, any other method of representing or honoring Satan or the practice of satanic worship on public property, in public schools, on property owned by public schools, or on any property owned by the state and subdivisions. That bill, HB 1282, was very revealing in its intentions. It said, the legislator finds that good and evil exist. The supreme being upon whom we depend 
for continued blessings, personifies that which is good. Evil is personified as a creature known as Satan. It is the duty of the government to play an appropriate role in protecting the inhabitant residents of Mississippi from evil while encouraging and facilitating good. It is legally and constitutionally consistent to afford Satan, who is universally understood to be an enemy of God, religious expression on public property by a state government that depends upon God for continued blessings. Such a legal view violates our state constitution and offends the God upon whom we depend and undermines our well-being. So, very startling language, obviously, to be seeing in, in government, um, you know, in legislation. I mean, as very similar to the IVF ruling in Alabama, um, the concurrence there where it sounded more like a sermon, you know, mentioning God 41 times more than legislation. I mean, seeing that, seeing discussions of Satan as a real figure and God and good and evil in legislation, and even in Mississippi, is obviously very alarming. Definitely. Um, now, fortunately, uh, as you know, these bans on religious expression, these bans on religious expression are clearly unconstitutional. But they strike at the heart of religious freedom. The government's forbidden from restricting people's rights on the basis of their religious beliefs. Now, that applies to Satanists and atheists as much as it applies to Christians. That's right, Chris. And another um, area where we're seeing issues and a lot of pushback is not just public displays on public property, but also um, with the Satanic Temples after school Satan clubs. Now, after school Satan clubs obviously do not actually teach children to believe in Satan or worship the devil. Instead, these clubs are entirely secular and they teach kids about really important topics like nature and science. Um, kids do arts and crafts there. And really, the Satanic Temple is just offering an inclusive, welcoming alternative to um, more traditional religious clubs that are found all over our country, like the Good News Club. And in fact, the Satanic Temple only opens after-school Satan clubs in schools where there's already a religious club like the Good News Club present. But sadly, we see a lot of pushback from school board members, administrators, teachers, and community members who want to illegally block after-school Satan clubs and treat them unfairly. But this is, of course, unconstitutional. If a public school district opens up its facilities for an organization to rent, it has to do so on an equal and neutral basis. A school a public school cannot discriminate against an organization based on its beliefs or its viewpoint. Um, recently, we actually had a after-school Satan Club situation come up in California. Do you want to tell us more about that, Chris? Yeah. So as you noted, uh, there is a lot of controversy around these after-school Satan Clubs. Um, they've been popping up all across the country and... Uh, as you also know, that they're basically they're showing up wherever there's a good news club. And in fact, a couple times now, Satan clubs have actually uh, announced that they were not going to open once uh, the good news club that they were there to counteract went away. So they're very true in their word on that. So this is not some situation where, you know, we now have a satanic version of the good news club that we have to worry about going around and potentially, um, you know, creating more religion in schools instead of less. They're only um, doing this in places where it already exists, and that's great. But in January, Lisa Davis, a school board member in Capistrano Unified School District in California, expressed she wants the district there to develop a policy to deny after-school access to school facilities for groups that don't align with their Christian values. Uh, this was, of course, in response to an after-school Satan Club opening in one of the schools that she represents. Um, in a speech she gave at the meeting, she implied that members of the Satanic Temple are comparable to Nazis, Hitler, the Proud Boys, Antifa, and the KKK. She actually stated she valued religious pluralism and freedom of religion, only to immediately denigrate uh, those who hold the minority re religious view, the, the members of the Satanic Temple. We actually have a clip of some of the things that she said in that meeting. We don't have the authority to do whatever we want as a board. Our clubs are also not set up carte blanche. We do not allow six-year-olds to run and lead a club. We would not approve Proud Boys clubs, bondage clubs, guns and shooting clubs, Antifa clubs, Nazi clubs, Hitler clubs, KKK clubs, Black Magic clubs, Ouija board clubs, club safe sex clubs, 
or would we? Honestly, in my view, Nazis and KKKs are terrible, but Satanists are the worst and absolutely contrary to everything I believe and stand for. Make no mistake, the Satanistic group is a hate group organized with a specific purpose to mock and demon Christian beliefs. They could very easily rebrand as an open-minded group, scientific group, or even an atheist group. Choosing to brand themselves as a satanic group serves only to express hate. Now imagine if she said that about any other group. She said, well, this Jewish group on campus, they're a hate group. Now, they could choose not to identify as a Jewish group. They could be a a group for some other secular topic, and that would be fine with me. Um, this is obviously ridiculous, and we wrote to the board reminding them that they're free to promote their personal religious beliefs however they wish in their personal capacities outside the school board. But as government officials, they can't be allowed to abuse their position to promote their personal religious beliefs and to denigrate members of minority religions. Uh, we also reminded them that as long as they allow other religious groups to host clubs in the school facilities after school hours, they must allow after school Satan. So they cannot in any way come up with some sort of policy that says, all right, you Satanists cannot come and use our school facilities. Now, if they want to go ahead and they're perfectly free to do so, to disallow all after school clubs and stop renting out the school, they can do that, but they can't discriminate um, by allowing certain religious groups and not others, which is, of course, the point of today's program, that if you want to have religious freedom, that, that means freedom for all religions, not just the ones that you think are okay or that you're willing to approve. Um, so while the Satanic Temple uh, you know, tends to get all the headlines and attention for pretty obvious reasons, we also engage in this important work. FFRF regularly partakes in similar efforts. We helped to put a secular display in state capitals each year to counter uh, Christian nativity scenes. We also give out a Nothing Fails Like Prayer Award to atheists, secularists, and other free thinkers who are asking for equal time to give secular invocations. One of FFRF's chapters, um, our chapter in Florida, has actually been very active in making sure that secular Americans continue to have a voice. Why don't you fill us in on some of those details, Chris? Yeah, as you said, down in Florida, uh, the Central Florida Free Thought community regularly gives secular invocations at city and county council meetings. You know, they work really hard to ensure that the voice of the non-religious is present and that invocations are not just used to promote, uh, promote Christianity. Um, so actually what happened recently was on February 7th, Joseph Richardson, a uh, Central Florida Free Thought Community board member, he was invited to deliver the opening invocation before the Tavares City Council. He delivered a respectful secular message of equality and diversity, encouraging members of the public and the council to reflect the wisdom and reason, wisdom of reason and empathy that binds us all together. He asked that the council be guided by the principles of inclusivity, fairness, and respect for the autonomy of every individual, and he celebrated the city's shared values, transcending creed, culture, and conviction. Um, unfortunately, that wasn't, you know, good enough uh, messaging because it didn't include Christianity. So, um, you know, we've got a little, we got a clip here showing you what happened. It's a little over two minutes in total, but we want to show you the whole event in real time so you can really see how respectful his invocation was and how, you know, quickly that message was pushed aside by the city council. Our thanks today to Mayor Grenier, the commissioners and the city staff for this invitation to do the invocation today. In this chamber of governance, let us unite in the spirit of reason, compassion, and the pursuit of justice. As we gather, may our hearts be open to the diversity that defines our community. This morning, let us draw inspiration from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, signed more than 75 years ago, serving as a guidepost, illuminating the path to equality, dignity, and liberty for all. May today's meetings, decisions, reflect the wisdom of reason and the empathy that binds us as fellow human beings. In the pursuit of goodwill to all in our county, may our actions be guided by the principles of inclusivity, fairness, and respect for the autonomy of every individual. Let this assembly today be a testament to the shared values that transcend creed, culture, and conviction. At the same time, may we be grateful for the progress we have made in the past 75 years 
and the many accomplishments that surely lie ahead. In closing, let us remember this work is a reflection of a commitment to the city and that these efforts will have a lasting impact on the lives of those who serve. Thank you. Mr. Clark, you would please. Good afternoon. Thank you for the privilege of allowing me to work with y'all. And thank you for the honor of allowing me to pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this blessed and glorious day. Thank you for the folks we work for. Thank you for the folks we work with. Thank you for the glorious city that we live in. Thank you for all the blessings you bestow on us. Please keep us on a righteous path. Please forgive us for our sins and bless those less fortunate. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. amen. So I give a lot of credit to Joseph there for not for keeping his cool. I mean, you could see him in the background there because that, that's, this is just sort of, you know, this Christian prayer apparently delivered because the invocation Joseph gave was not, you know, sufficiently Christian. This was discriminatory and unconstitutional. Um, and unfortunately, this isn't the first time this happened to Joseph. In fact, this is the fourth time that a local government in Florida has felt the need to correct his secular invocation. Um, a similar corrective prayer actually happened in the Arizona legislature in 2017. Uh, after a state legislator gave a secular invocation, one of her colleagues requested and received permission to deliver a Christian one right after. And uh, in 2019, after um, Joseph gave a secular invocation in the city of Osoe, Osoe, Okoe, the mayor uh, actually apologized, saying, this is something that was brought to us to do, not that we do it. Um, so absolutely ridiculous, uh, absolutely a violation of uh, the, the rights and the Constitution. Uh, obviously, as we know, in the Greece uh, v. Galloway decision, which where the Supreme Court said, it's fine for city councils to open up their meetings with prayer. Uh, that was under very strict circumstances, which is that the city would allow anyone of any faith to give a prayer. Um, you know, and we can see here, and we've seen since that time, that city councils aren't abiding by that. They're violating the law, and they're using these as opportunities to push Christianity. Um, so once again, it's not about religious freedom. They would claim this has something to do with religious freedom, which it obviously does not having prayer in city council meetings, but they are really using it to advance Christianity. And when someone, another faith, or in this case, non-belief, you know, comes up, delivers a, a great message, you know, not, this was not, you know, Joseph didn't come to the meeting and make a mockery of the invocation. He didn't come up and make jokes or make light of it. He, you know, he, he fulfilled the purpose that ostensibly the opening invocation is supposed to have and delivered a, a good message. And, you know, they, instead of respecting that and allowing him to do that, they had to have a Christian prayer corrected because that's, that's what they wanted to advance Christianity. That's the point of these prayers, you know. So we wrote to the council asking that they immediately apologize to Joseph and ensure that the discriminatory contact conduct exhibited at the February 7th meeting does not recur. You know, if the board cannot treat invocation speakers equally, instead of favoring Christianity and denigrating non-believers, the practice of having an invocation needs to be eliminated entirely. Um, and that, that really is obviously the solution that FFR is pushing for in these situations. There's no reason for our city council, our county councils to open with prayer, um, especially prayers that don't represent uh, everyone in the community. And so, you know, we're going to work to end these prayers, but as long as we're going to have invocations at meetings, then atheists, Satanists, minority religions, everyone needs to be treated equally and with, with respect, and this needs to, you know, that, that's what real religious freedom looks like. Uh, everyone being able to participate, everyone being a full citizen, nobody being denied or denigrated for their religious beliefs. Um, so after this incident, uh, David, jo David and Jocelyn Williams, co-founders of the Central Florida Free Thought community and frequent invocation deliverers themselves, they went to the next council meeting to call out this discriminatory conduct. Uh, here's Jocelyn speaking first. The audio is a little bit rough, but we've included captions for you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to address you today um, mm -hmm. during the public comment. As a, as a mother, a Central Florida citizen, a teacher, and a humanist celebrant serving the people in Tavares, um, I've always respected, valued, respect people of diverse perspectives. And today I'd like to share my thoughts on the practice of praying after our invocation, uh, a practice that in my opinion runs counter to the shared principles of community we should all strive to uphold. I've been writing and providing invocations, non-religious invocations, 14, including this video. 
coming here for 10 years. These invocations have been carefully written to embrace the diversity of beliefs present in our community. I believe we're all on the same team. We all want the city to thrive. And these meetings are a place where we can all come together and work together. I firmly believe that public spaces should be welcoming of all faith as well as those who hold secular or non-religious beliefs. Inclusivity fosters a sense of unity and respect making the community stronger and more resilient in times of crisis. The issue at hand is the practice of prayer immediately following our invocations and only our invocations. While invocations themselves vary in their spiritual or secular nature, the subsequent act of praying assumes a specific religious framework. This can unintentionally alienate those who do not share the same faith or belief system. Our public gatherings should be a, form, a forum for unity and understanding, mutual respect, rather than dividing us all over this line. It's essential to recognize that our community is composed of people of various walks of life, each with their own set of beliefs, at times different from our own. By adopting a more inclusive approach, we create an environment where everyone feels acknowledged and valued, and fostering a sense of belonging that strengthens the fabric of our community. Public institutions have a responsibility to uphold the separation of church and state, however you define that, and to ensure that no particular religion is given preference over others. By allowing prayers to follow invocations, we risk blurring the lines between a limited public forum and government speech. Not only is this legally risky, but it potentially excludes those who don't adhere to the same faith from what should be a welcome. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Jocelyn, such a great speaker. And uh, obviously it was a lot more considerate and measured than I might be uh, in similar circumstances. You know, of course, coming before these people who've already shown that they're willing to discriminate against these people. And, um, you know, hopefully they take her words to heart. But uh, we also now have a clip of uh, her husband, David, uh, giving his statement immediately after hers. We provided your invitation at the last meeting. And while I'm a resident of Oviedo, I'm also a Navy veteran, a member of clergy, and I serve as board secretary for the Interfaith Council of Central Florida, also on the Council or the Commission for Religious Freedom of Central Florida. It's in that spirit that I'm here to speak to you today. And I was thinking about how best to make the point that your action after our invitation uh, at the last meeting was inappropriate, but you already have that information in your inboxes already. Um, it's, not, it's not handy for you. If you haven't read that yet, I've got copies for you. Member, happy to hand that off. Should be one for each and an extra. You heard from the Interfaith Council of Central Florida, the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Lake County, Central Florida Commission on Religious Freedom, Central Florida Pledge, championed in part by Dr. Joel Hunter. What they wrote were things like, we look to leaders to set an example of fairness and equality. Your actions may convey a message of superiority and derision for someone participating in the invocation opportunity at the day's invitation. This is really easy to understand. It's so easy we teach it to our kids. The idea that we should treat other people the way we want to be treated is what we're talking about. I admit I was tempted by the idea to stand up after Fred offered his prayer today and give my perspective. But that wasn't the right time to one up someone who said something I disagreed with. It wasn't the time for debate or even rebuttal. That would be rude to him. It would be rude to you, more importantly, as the person, as the body who invited him to appear. That time is set aside on your agenda for him and only him alone, in this case, today, without rebuttal. To do otherwise would treat him as if he were a second-class citizen. What you've done at the beginning of your meetings is open what is referred to by attorneys as a limited public forum. You don't have to do that, but if you choose to do so, the forum comes with rights for your guests and responsibilities for you as the host. We're quite familiar with the requirements of these forums as we've delivered nearly 150 invocations in the last 10 years at more than 20 venues around Central Florida, four of them right here for your predecessors and you without incident. We know that this has been a learning experience We've helped cities and counties through it before. We hope you'll acknowledge that learning has happened 
in an intentional way. Equal treatment isn't too much. It's the least we should expect. Thank you. Once again, obviously just a tremendous speaker and we're so grateful for Dave Williamson, Jocelyn and Joseph Richardson for the work they're doing in Florida because, you know, without them, without their willingness to go before these counselors who clearly don't want them there and don't want them participating, you know, what would happen is, for example, this council would just do a Christian prayer every week. Uh, nobody would really say anything, um, you know, but here they're able to jump in, they're able to give the non-religious expression and of course, their participation there in, um, you know, kind of hitting back against the, the council for its decision to discriminate and to sort of treat atheists uh, in this way. Um, you know, it's really important and their work there is important. I wish we had more activists like them around the country doing things like this. And of course, we'd encourage anyone out there to go ahead and do that. You should, you know, if your council is giving some sort of invocation and they allow people to sign up or you can find a way to get on that list, you know, you should go in and do do what they're doing, you know, give it a, a really respectful secular message. You know, this isn't a time to come in. You're not going to go there to denigrate other religions because that's, you know, not, not the point of this. You know, we want to make sure everyone, you know, has real religious freedom in these situations. Of course, that's what we're pushing for. And, and that's what's important is that religious freedom means freedom for every religion and equal treatment of all religions, which of course is why the separation of church and state is necessary for that. Because if the state pushes, represents, promotes one religion, then, you know, we can't all have all religions being treated equally, you know. So unfortunately, this uh, exclusion of non-religious from invocation continues to be a problem around the, um, around the country, despite clear legal precedent indicating that invocations must be open to any and all prayer givers. Um, they're being used to promote Christianity, you know, so much for religious freedom. Uh, in fact, U.S. Representative Mark Pocan has even invited FFR of co-president Dan Barker to serve as a guest chaplain in the U.S. House of Representatives. This nomination made in a letter to Reverend Margaret Grun Kibben, Kibben, chaplain of the U.S. House of Representatives, represents a significant step forward in promoting religious diversity and highlighting highlights the importance of the inclusion of non-religious Americans in government proceedings. Uh, Reps Jared Huffman, Jamie Raskin, Hank Johnson, Julia Brownlee, and Jan Schakowsky all signed on to this letter. You know, and if this, this were to happen, this would be a historic milestone that would further emphasize the values of religious accommodation and free exercise of religion as enshrined in our Constitution. So that's what, you know, this is an opportunity besides stopping things like what's going on in Florida, you know, allowing Dan to come and give that invocation. You know, he's got a representative asking. There are multiple representatives signed on. They want his voice there representing atheists in Congress. And um, unfortunately, we've not heard. It doesn't seem like the chaplain's going to allow that. Um, and, and that's a shame and, and shows what they really think of religious freedom. Yeah, it's really unfortunate that they have yet to approve Dan or it's unclear if they're going to. Um, but it's great that the request has even been made. So hopefully that someday that is able to come to fruition. Um, let's turn now to some of our questions. Starting off, um, a question from Dan B. How about a bill banning, um, banner banning bills? How would that go? Ban I think he's asking, um, how would someone introduce a bill to basically ban people from banning um, religious displays on public property? So kind of like an anti-display um, um, discrimination bill. Yeah, I wonder who Dan B is. That could be anyone, truly, in the world. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, uh, yeah, I'm not sure exactly how or what the, you know, I'm, I don't I don't really have a great answer to that. I don't know if you do. Yeah, I mean, I think um, the thing is that we don't really need a bill preventing um, legislators from banning certain public displays because, you know, at least theoretically, the First Amendment pretty much already does that. If um, right. a government, whether it's a state government, federal government, whoever decides to open up a limited public forum and allow citizens or um, citizen organizations to put up displays, like holiday displays, then that limited public forum has to be administered in a 
fair and equal and neutral way, and they can't discriminate based on the content of speech or someone's religion. No, that's good. That that is what I was struggling to put put into words. That that that's completely unnecessary because that's already the Constitution is our banning ban bill. You know. <laughs> All right. We have another question. Doesn't the Supreme Court Greece decision? allow Christian prayer at government meetings. We already um, covered that a little bit, but is there anything you want to add to what we've said about that? Yeah, so Greece basically, what, what happened was they did rule you can have prayer at meetings. Now, that ruling was very explicit that the situation going on in Greece where they allowed that is that anyone would be allowed to give it. And in fact, in Greece, atheists had been given the opportunity before to do it. Um, you know, they, they did reiterate that, of course, if the prayer were being used for what they're describing there to advance Christianity, as in, like, if every single prayer was Christian, always, and there was no way they would ever not be, or if the government itself was getting involved in the prayer, things like that, that it would uh, still violate the Constitution. Um, so these places that are discriminating against atheists, non-religious people, and just using it to advance Christianity, they are still violating law. In fact, we took a lawsuit in... Um, North Carolina, um, or was it North Carolina? Now I'm going to get the location wrong. But anyway, we took a lawsuit over a, a city council that was um, starting every single meeting with the Lord's Prayer. Um, clearly not a practice of prayer that is inclusive of everyone, that, that's not for religious purposes. Saying the Lord's Prayer at every meeting is clearly meant to instill Christianity through the government. Um, and that was why we had to take that case. And so things like that are still legal. Unfortunately, we get a lot of complaints all the time about people like, hey, my government meeting is praying. Um, and unfortunately, unless they are discriminating in some way, um, you know, prayer is unfortunately allowed at, at um, city council meetings, uh, government meetings, and things like that. Uh, it is important to note, though, that uh, that does not encompass school board meetings. That is a different situation, and many uh, different courts around the country have ruled that because of its close proximity to schools, the involvement with students, school board meetings don't fall under that narrow exception that allows you know, city councils to open with prayer. So we're still pushing hard and making sure that any school boards are not including prayer at their meetings. Definitely. Um, and even though in some circumstances prayer at government meetings can be okay, we still really encourage people to let their local governments know if they do not like the prayer practice. Um, sometimes we write letters to city councils and we'll hear back and they'll say, well, we've been doing this for 15 years and no one has ever complained once, even though we have you know, one or two or sometimes many people um, complaining to us and saying that they feel discriminated against, that the prayer doesn't represent them, that they don't like it, uh, but they haven't actually told their city council that. So we still really um, encourage people to reach out and try to be active in their community. Yeah, definitely. Um, another question, with the, frequent, with the frequent corrective prayers being given after um, Richardson secular invocations. Is there a case for a lawsuit brewing? Yeah, I mean, as we know, so that was a bunch of different um, places. Uh, certainly, if you know uh, they come back again here in Tavares and, and do it, and the same thing happens, if we can establish a pattern, um, then yeah, that would be a great opportunity potentially if we're able to 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 take legal action. Um, you know, it's unfortunate that they're. There's just a lot that goes into a lawsuit. You know, obviously FF4F, we try to address, you know, hundreds, potentially thousands, often many years of violations, um, many of which, even if we're, you know, even if they're clearly constitutional violations, we can't take action on. Um, but in this situation, yeah, certainly any any city council that uh, is clearly violating the law, you know, is leaving themselves open to potential legal liability. We have taken cases in the past uh, in Florida regarding. Um, you know, David Williamson and, and Central Florida Free Thought was involved in that where it was a similar situation, just exclusion, clearly using government meetings to push Christianity and not allowing other groups to um, be represented. So definitely could lead to something in the future if, if this sort of thing keeps happening. Um, do you think that Satanists are targeted by Christian nationalist legislation because they're an easier target to pick on than, say, the Muslim or Jewish populations. Yeah, I mean, I think that is a big part of it. I mean, 
you know, that's kind of the flip side of obviously the Satanic Temple chose to use Satan as, as sort of the symbolism that they're using for a, for a reason because of its provocative nature. But then, yeah, that cuts back the other way where there are people out there who are less sympathetic towards Satanists and might say, well, yeah, I kind of think that all religions should, um, you know, be treated the same. But I don't know about Satanists, especially obviously Christians have a certain view of Satan and Satanism, but that's that's the point of religious freedom is you don't get to dictate other people's views. Uh, and if we're going to allow freedom for those religions, that's all religions, regardless of whether you support them or not. But I definitely agree that the that there's just no way at this point, even with how thing bad, how bad things have gotten in terms of Christian nationalism, I don't, I mean, I couldn't imagine any legislator, even in these situations, proposing a similar law for say. Jewish people and saying we're not going to allow Jewish expression, Muslim expression, um, you know, even though Muslims are unfortunately still pretty um, denigrated in, in our country um, as well. But I, even that, they, they wouldn't do that. Only, only Satanists are at a level where I think they feel comfortable um, doing things like this. And that, that's what makes them a good representation and a good test of, you know, do you really truly believe in religious freedom? Because if you do, you don't get to dictate what religions, you know, get to be involved. Definitely. Um, another school-related question. When school board members like Davis push for developing policies that are exclusionary to Satanists, are they ripe for an impeachment of some sort? So can the school board members potentially um, get kicked off the school board for doing that kind of thing, I think is what this question is asking. Yeah. Um, I think that would depend a little bit from school board to school board, I'm sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, we, I mean, we deal with this issue all the time. Now, unfortunately, a lot, yep, unfortunately, a lot of people are getting onto school boards who shouldn't be there, who are going there with the explicit purpose of pushing Christian agendas. They want to ban books and get involved in all these sort of cultural wars, and not, they're not actually there to work for the students or to address the issues the district needs to. And so we deal with this all the time where we're writing to school board. Uh, and oftentimes, we'll even hear back from other school board members who will say, we want to do what's right for the students. This particular board member is the one coming in, promoting their Christianity and promoting these issues. And unfortunately, there's just nothing they can do about it. Um, these are elected officials. All the board members are on the same level. There's not really anyone above them that can fire and do it. Some boards do have provisions for, for like censuring and can take some actions. But unfortunately, uh, at the end of the day, um, you know, this, these people need to be um, taken out by the members of the community and, and taken out as in voted out, not in any other way. Um, that it's up to the community members to push back to either get them to change, you know, what they're doing because it's not popular amongst the people or or some sort of action like that. Um, or, you know, if it, if it does cross the line far enough that a lawsuit happens, that can happen. But even then, what, what sucks then is the school district, the board itself is going to, you know, take the punishment for this person because obviously the school is going to have to pay to defend uh, their Christian nationalist actions. Um, and so it could end up ta costing taxpayers hundreds of thousands of dollars because this one person wants to use the board to push their agenda, which is unfortunate. Yeah. So... That concludes Ask an Atheist for this week. Don't forget, we also have a weekly broadcast TV show, Free Thought Matters. This week, Annie Lori Gaylor and Dan Barker speak with longtime CEO of American Atheist, Barry Lynn. Here's a preview. People go, God is all-knowing. Well, if you read the Bible, you just go to the book of Genesis. He creates the world. He creates two people. Adam and Eve, they're in the Garden of Eden, but then he can't find them. <laughs> he, just, he can't locate them. There are so many profoundly silly ideas about what a divine presence ought to mean. And unfortunately, when you take those views, add them to the cultural views of the religious right, as so-called Christian nationalists now, you have a recipe for complete and utter disaster. You can see Free Thought Matters on TV stations all across the U.S. and on FFRF's Facebook and YouTube channels. And don't miss Free Thought Radio. This week, the show Annie Laurie and Dan will be talking with Wisconsin State Senator Keldo Royce on efforts to keep religion and government separate. You can find Free Thought Radio at ffrf.org radio. 
If you're not a member of FFRF and you want to learn more about us, check out FFRF's website at ffrf.org. And if you're a member already, thank you. And if you're not, please join us. This has been Ask an Atheist. Thank you.